But, but the Harry Mudd in Discovery is more dangerous. There's, he's definitely more dangerous. I, I, there, there was more than an edge to him. Like there was the humor, there was the slyness, there was the manipulation. But we did give him a darker, more dangerous, like character. And also, uh, conversely, yes, that's true. Conversely, you know, discovery sometimes could use a little laughter in it because it's just so damn serious all the time. You know, it's dying over and over again and falling in love and getting infested by molds and stuff. Like it's uh, so. It was it was fun to also bring some uh, comic relief to the show as well. So and and you know and. I mean, you guys know way better than, than me, but I know part of the reason that I love the original series and the next generation were those episodes that were almost comedic episodes. I mean, there'd be standalone episodes that were almost like a sitcom. Tribbles. <laughs> exactly. Um, but uh, so humor is a part of the Star Trek universe. Uh, the, the introduction, Choose Your Pain, uh, when you're in, in the Klingon break with uh, with Jason Isaacs and Shazam, Shazam, like what, like working with them initially, just to sort of like introduce the character. Uh, what was it like working with, with those two guys in those scenes from the, the first of your two episodes as Harry? Yeah. Um, well, I was a little bit nervous. I mean, it was pretty crazy walking into all those sets that yeah. get built up in Canada because they had the the Shinsu and they had the Klingon ships and the, and the, and the Discovery and uh, just, I mean, just in a room this size, they had a couple of like spaceships and, and bridges and, you know, sick bays and stuff. And it was, it was a little bit intimidating and overwhelming. Um, but, uh, and also it was a little tricky to find his voice because Mud speaks almost Shakespearean English, you know, it's, it's always, it's overly flowery, and um, uh, he uses language in a, in a very heightened way. Um, and you know, where a lot of Star Trek Discovery is a little bit like understated, like shoot him with the phaser. <laughs> you know, it's like a little. I know, but Harry Mod is it, it, Fluvian, Is that a word? I should look it up. <laughs> um, and uh, so. It was a little tricky to kind of find, I didn't, you know, have a rehearsal, so I was just thrown in. It was a little tricky to find his character there in that prison cell, but I thought it was a really expertly written uh, plot line there, and it was great working with the great Jason Isaacs, who's, he just, he just brings it, he's, um, he's just a terrific actor, and I knew I needed to kind of be at the top of my game to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. Well, the, the, uh... That was the intro, but I have to say that, that Magic to Make the Sanest Man Go Mad, of the 15 episodes of Discovery, that one was my favorite. Because what you just said about... That was a pathetic amount of applause. That was your cue. Magic to Make the Sanest Man Go Mad. That was your cue. my favorite episode of Discovery. Cheer up and applause. The likes of which had never here to which been for, formed, heard in Las Vegas Star Trek Athana. <laughs> so, but it was like 12 people like, yeah, I like, I like that one. No, but you're like forgiven. That. Forgiven, I love you. <laughs> so by that episode, I have to say, like, like that was a standalone episode. Yeah. It, and I was like, wow, this really felt like, I mean, he like, hid in a space whale. Right? I mean, how cool is that? That sound like, 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 yeah, it's like, like, it's like a tall glass of water. Like, he's, he is in the room. I look at, but again, the danger of it. Like, I felt like, oh, the discovery's kind of, it's, it's kind of screwed. But that was your first real interaction with everyone else. So, was it like to, to have that episode to yourself and to work with everyone? I spent like Sidney Blood, who's fantastic, and Doug Jones. The whole the rest of the cast. Well, it was it was crazy because the episode that I read the week before we started shooting was completely different than the episode that we started shooting. So this was you know there's still it was pretty early on in the series and there'd been some writer turnover and stuff. So people they were really finding their sea legs as a series. So 
A lot of it was scrapped. It was a little bit overwritten. A lot of it was scrapped and rewritten at the last minute. Well, not the last minute, but the, you know, the, the three days, four days before we started shooting, there was a mammoth rewrite on the, on the mud stuff. And I just want to give a shout out to a very special writer on the current staff named Ted Sullivan. And uh, yeah, he's, he's really something. And he flew in from LA and he really helped me a lot and with the character and with the plotting and, and um, I mean, the directors were, were great as well. But uh, he's, a, he's a great resource in the Star Trek universe. I really enjoyed working with him. I think he really got Henry Mudd's voice and um, he's a great asset to that writer's room. So it was really uh, exciting. Um, uh, Sonequa is uh, an exceptional human being, a great actress, and uh, just one of the kindest people you'd ever want to meet, the most integrity, and, uh, and the great Doug Jones, who I'm in awe of. Uh, yeah, he, um, you know, he's known for his, you know, his prosthetic work and, and this and that, but he's a great actor. He's a terrific actor. He really has made Saru uh, one of the most memorable kind of alien characters of all time. So it was great for me, but but most importantly, and you guys can appreciate this, because like I'm just I'm just I'm a lowly sitcom actor, and uh, I got to fire a phaser. I got to be teleported. I was beamed away. I sat in the captain's chair, and I think I think they said this in in canon in Star Trek canon. I was the only non-captain to record a captain's log. And that was my idea. I said, I had, they had me kind of doing the monologue, like Harry Mudd was in the captain's chambers, and he's like, um, well, here I am, computer, you know, finally got control of the ship, of my ship, maybe I'll call it, the, I'll rename it the Harry Mudd or something. I had some kind of monologue like that. I'm like, we should do starting 25th and Captain's Law, Captain Harry Mudd reporting, and do the whole monologue back the way. So they shifted the, uh, the dialogue, where I think I'm the only non-captain to do it the law. So it was uh, just super exciting uh, for me as an actor, and it, was a, it, was a, it ended up being a very tight, well-written episode, and David Barrett, the director, brought a lot of great visual flair to it. I just want to say that hearing your excitement, at saying, I got to fire a phaser. I got to be transported. I got to sit in the cabin chair. Because I was going to ask you about that if you like had a moment. I said teleported, didn't I? Transported. I was up at 4 30 this right. morning to fly here. My brain's not. That's okay. But just, yeah, so you did have those moments where you were able to be in the moment and say, look what I'm doing. It was so cool. <laughs> and I got to kill Jason Isaacs over and over and over again, just like the rest of the cast and crew wanted to do on a daily basis. <laughs> At that time. So, so, did you know where that character was going? Where, where Orca was going? Did you know what was inside? I story? did. They, they gave me the inside scoop. Did. Yeah, yeah. And it was so cool, they told me, I was like, no way! What? That's what's happening? So yeah, I got some good behind-the-scenes scoop out of it. Well, this is fun. Well, well, it's, it's very it's exciting because we have not seen the last of Hardcore and Fenton in the mud. Mm -hmm. I, this, this great news that came out of San Diego about uh, uh, getting a standalone uh, short. Uh, yeah. What, what they tell you about that, that you can share with us? Um, so... I don't really know, um, I haven't seen or read the other shorts yet. They said, we're going to do these Star Trek shorts that have never been done before. They're going to be like 8 to 12 minute mini films uh, that take you into different aspects of the Star Trek universe. And we're going to shoot them concurrently with the show. I think it would be really cool. And I was like, well, okay. And then they sent me the script. It's fantastic. This script they sent me. Um, uh, what's the, what's the animated show, Mort? Rick and Morty. This writer from Rick and Morty wrote it. <laughs> and it's really funny, but it's, it's twisted, too. And 
in a really delicious way, and it stars Mud, and um, uh, I get to direct it, which is amazing. Um, so now I directed myself in the office three different episodes, but the office didn't have special effects. <laughs> we didn't have visual effects. We didn't have these kind of like uh, the intricacy of shooting. This is a very complicated thing. So we also they also got me a storyboard artist. For the first time I got to work with a storyboard artist, which is an amazing process to describe how you see the scene and they're like sketching away on their iPads and you know, helping you choose camera angles and, and stuff like that to, to best tell the story. Um, it's not my strong point, but uh, uh, I'm just learning a ton. It's, um, I feel really privileged to be able to do it, and it's, I think the fans are, are just going to love this. Uh, it's, it's very funny and weird. You see some alien situations you've never seen before in the Star Trek canon, and uh, uh, I, I'm thrilled. Wow, that's so exciting. You know, you, you talk about being a fan, like, like uh, growing up and everything like that. So, like, what were those episodes when you were growing up that you loved? Like, like your favorites that, that you, like, for me it was Sitting on the Edge Forever, of course, New Stage Machine, stuff like that. Yeah, I, I, all, all of those, all of those classic episodes, I watched over and over again. Um, you know, it was in syndication in the 70s, and I was a geeky little kid living in Olympia, Washington. And I went home from school. Was that for Olympia or Washington? Yes. Let me try this. I was living in Washington. Okay. I was living in Olympia. No, you're lying. You can't lie and woo at the same time. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'd come home from school every day and I would watch, I would watch Star Trek and it was like my other family, you know, and I think, like, for, maybe for some of us, I had a pretty miserable family situation. I'd much rather be with my Star Trek family than my actual family. Can I get around? Yeah, there's, there's too many episodes. I even like, I even like, like, Spock's brain. I even like the, the bad ones, you know? I, Really? So much pain. Yeah, um, you're so alone. Um, yeah, so it was, it was a big part of growing up. I had a, I put together a model of Enterprise with all the little stickers on it. I had a coloring book. I had a technical book that explained how everything worked. Did um, you have the trading cards? I didn't, I didn't do the cards. And I watched, I watched originally the Saturday morning cartoons as they aired. I mean, I was like appointment television, whatever it was, like 9.30 a.m. CBS, you know, and that's where the other Harry Mudd episode aired. So, the, uh, as the shows went on, where you, like you mentioned Next Generation, did you keep going with it? Did you get to Deep Space Nine and Voyager, or, or were you just, like, you know, living your life and, like, busy with that? When Next Generation came on, I was just finishing college, and, uh, so I was a really broke, struggling actor for most of those years, and I would always watch Next Generation when I could. But a lot of those years I didn't have a TV, and there wasn't a way you could stream them. You know, it was back in the day, like if you missed it, you missed it. And so I would say I saw about half of the Next Generation episodes, but I didn't see them all, and I really liked Deep Space Nine, so I was really uh, into that. And I did a play with Kate Mulgrew. We did Shakespeare in the Park and Titus Andronicus in Central Park, and she was, Tamara, Queen of the Goths. She was an amazing actress, a Shakespearean actress, and I, I played a supporting role in that. And then Gates McFadden, Dr. Crusher, was my clown teacher at NYU. This is a true story. I don't know if you know this about her. Maybe the super fans know this. She studied at the Lecoq School of Movement and Clowning in Paris with Jacques Lecoq, the famous teacher. And, um, uh, she taught us at NYU clown, you know, wearing the red nose and stuff like that. And uh, so I have a, I have a connection to those shows as well. Did you ever uh, meet Shatner? I did a talk show once with Shatner. Um, I think we were on the same. No, I was doing Jay Leno, and he was doing like a, a bit on Jay Leno. He wasn't one of the guests, and um, I, 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 I think I was like. Uh, it's such a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Shatner. I was like a true like fan, and, and he was like, oh. you know, thank you, uh, uh. And, uh, but I, uh, uh, but I was, 
I didn't like properly introduce myself. I think he thought I was like part of the janitorial staff or something. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. That's the beauty of it. Uh, but I have to say, one, one of my favorite Star Trek movies of them all is Galaxy Quest. <laughs> It is, this is your first convention, and like, did you, like, but you, now that you're experiencing a lot of speaking, I'm like, boy, they just like hit the nail on the head. This is it, this is Galaxy Quest come to life. I'm, I'm having flashbacks of 1999. This is fantastic. Yeah, we need the spaceship to crash into the, into the ceiling. We need Sam Rockwell and Sigourney Weaver to come out on stage. That was my very first movie. First movie. Oh, my very first movie, Galaxy Quest. What was it like to, to not just work on a film, your first movie, but that, like yeah, that kind of production? That summer, I did Galaxy Quest and I did Almost Famous. And they were both DreamWorks films, and they're two of the best scripts I've ever read. And two of the best movies made in the last 30 years. And uh, it was it was remarkable. I mean, I, I remember reading Galaxy Quest and said, this is hysterical. And it was even better than, than they had it in the script. And, it's one of those rare, like, I think David Mamet said that Galaxy Quest is on his list of, of ten perfect films. Like, there's only, like, ten perfect films, and Galaxy Quest is one of them. It's a perfect film. And you know what? I have to say, so is Almost Famous. That is a perfect film. Uh, you know, Cameron Crowe is not just a writer. It is a great screenplay. But as a director, what was it like working with him? What do you, what do you sort of, like, take with you when you work with someone like Cameron Crowe? Especially when you get into more, uh, you know, more depth and more comedy, like you did, you know, The Office. And, uh, what do you take from a director like that? Well, Cameron uh, is a very special person, and I remember auditioning uh, for a, I auditioned for a couple of different supporting roles, and um, I went into his office in Santa Monica, and, uh, and I was sitting, you know, on a chair like this. And then Cameron comes in and he goes, and he goes like, hey man, it's Cameron. How's it going? I think he had flip flops and shorts. And he's like, so good to meet you. I looked your audition on the tape and it's like, you know, let's just read some stuff. Let me grab this camera here. And, uh, you know, let's just, yeah, let's just read some stuff. <laughs> and then he sits down at my feet. And um, with the camera, we just start reading some of the different characters and stuff like that. But, that is very, very rare where most directors in Hollywood are behind the table and don't shake your hands like, hello, welcome. Yes, what are you, what are you doing today? Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. You know, it's very uh, aloof and he's just very genial and uh, passionate. And it was working with Cameron in that. And then I did a thing on his roadies, um, his short-lived show. Um, one person clap, thank you, <laughs> Rhodes fan. And uh, Cameron brings such heart and passion to his uh, to his work, um, and on just on the set, it's just it's just big heartedness. He cares deeply about the stories he tells, and he's completely invested. Absolutely, you know, one of one of my favorite TV shows of the last like twenty years, Six Feet Under. Woo! I mean, how long was the that show, especially especially the last episode, which was so profound. Um, you know, there's really no show like that. It's so different. It still stands up and holds up. It could be to air today, and it would fit right in with our, with our current time. Right. Uh, what, what do you, you know, that was a that was a, a breakthrough for you, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Arthur Martin. That's right. And um, what was that like working on that show? Yeah, so that was a breakthrough role that I got maybe in 2003 or something like that. Um, and I was just kind of dinking around Hollywood playing little roles. And, um, you know, when I first moved there, I landed Galaxy Quest and Almost Famous. I was like, oh, this is a cinch. I'm gonna, this is gonna be great. I, I promptly did not work for a year after that. So um, I kept auditioning for Six Feet Under. They kept bringing me in for uh, very small roles and I kept not booking the small roles. So. I literally missed out on like four different roles. But if I had been cast in one of those small roles that had like three or four lines, I wouldn't have gotten to do Arthur on the show, which I think is a great lesson for anyone as an artist or struggling with anything. Like you never know when, the, when those failures are actually successes in disguise. 
so then I did it. I auditioned for like a gay choir member with like three lines, and and I came out, and then I saw on the breakdowns, which is where they list the different parts. I saw the Arthur Martin and said, you know, a very odd, um, you know, character. It was an undertaker as assistant and like Peter Sellers type. And I was like, oh my god, that's me. I could do that. So I. I went to the casting person, I was like, hey, can I, can I actually audition for that role? I know that, forgive me if I'm stepping over any boundaries here. And she's like, oh, let me, let me find out. Let me ask him if you can do that. I'm not being uh, offensive. That's actually how she talks. And ask anyone, she's infamous. Let me go see, she talks about it. And she went in and she's like, Rand, you might want to see you for it. That's great. Can you come back in an hour and do a lot prior? So I, um, I just took the script and went off and got a coffee and went in and, and then got that role and that role really, uh, it, was, it was amazing because I remember that night when I had a call back and read with uh, Francis Conroy um, and my manager called me and, and I, he said, Rain, your entire life is about to change. And it was really that kind of a role that like shifted everything. So I'm super grateful for that experience. Well, the, the role that shifted it even further, obviously. I mean, how did The Office change your life? How did it change my life? I mean, in so many ways, I mean, it just, it was one of those, I mean, it's just a rare, magical, I mean, in a, in a weird way, there's a parallel to like Star Trek, the original series, you know, that, that this show just really took on a life of its own and uh, has a huge fan base, and uh, there's people that watch the show over and over again. They've seen people come up to me like, I've seen every episode 12 times. Woo! And I say, get a life. Let's <laughs> <laughs> think about it. That's 60 hours. No, I don't know how many hours, but it's like, that's like a year of your life you've spent to the office. No, but the fans are amazing. It was one of those, it's one of the last great sitcoms. It was Thursday night appointment television on NBC, kind of before that kind of way of watching television ended. And, uh, and it holds up, and it's really smart, and uh, it changed my life in so many ways. It opened so many doors, it allowed me to do a lot of different uh, movies, uh, some, some cool ones and some bad ones, but I got to do some great, some great stuff, meet a lot of great people, and uh, I bought a house, so that was good. And uh, yeah, it, I mean, it, you know, absolutely it changed my life, and uh, yeah, I'm grateful for that as well. What was the biggest challenge in, in, in playing Dwight? Because you know, you are clearly a Star Trek fan, but Dwight was a Battlestar Galactica fan. I know. And how do you do that? <laughs> no, they, the, the writers originally were like, well, Dwight should be a Star Wars fan. And they were, and they were like, no, no, no. Like, he needs to be like a more obscure science fiction. Like, there's something. So that's right when Battlestar Galactica was happening. Like, he's a huge Battlestar Galactica fan. So I loved Battlestar Galactica, especially the first, yeah, especially the first two, three seasons. I thought were just some of the best sci-fi that's ever been on TV. It was, I thought it was just fascinating that you know there was this one, this one idea in it that was just so brave, which was that the, the cyborgs believed in God, and the humans were polytheists, or atheists, but they believed in multiple gods, but then, the, so it was this crazy, like, had this spiritual, religious, you know, themes and threads running through it, it was uh, fascinating. You know, the, the thing about BSG, because Battlestar Galactica, I think of as the 78 show, and BSG, I think of as the, the Rob Moore David I show, and the, the great thing about that show, I, I completely agree, it's, it's brilliant, it's definitely one of the best shows of the 21st century. Perfect 9-11, post-9-11 allegory, but the way, as the show progressed, the humans and the silence, uh, we said, said cyborgs, I'm sorry. <laughs> My brain's not working. For real, it's okay. Um, but they became more unlike than unlike, and it was so philosophical and deep, I'm digressing. I apologize. I love PSG. Uh, but, uh, you know, with all these superhero movies that we've seen in the last 20 years, starting with Blade in 1998, and the way the genre has really grown, evolved, expanded, I mean, look at the MCU, 
one movie that I really love, one that is under seen, that is superb, is super. Superb. Superb. Yes. That was a dark movie. Yes. <laughs> you can see it, it's on Netflix, James Gunn, it was his second movie, he did Slither, and then he did Super, and then he did Guardians of the Galaxy, of course. And, um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a dark. It's dark, it's really, it's, it's so interesting because it's really funny and really weird and super dark all at the same time. Um, and uh, I was at the office on a lighting break and I was at Jenna Fisher's, you know, Pam, the receptionist area. And she goes, you know, James, she used to be married to James Gunn, and they're still really close, good friends. It was one of the sweetest divorces of all time. They kind of amicably said, you know, we really don't belong together, and we should be married. Yeah, okay, well, let's just divide things fairly and shake hands and talk. It's great, okay, great. So it was, I mean, it was completely amicable. And, um, and uh, even James is friends with her new husband, and said, so it's great. And she was like, James wrote a film called Super years ago, and they could never get it made, but he'd be perfect for that. You should talk to him about it. She goes, I'm going to write him right now. And she wrote, hey, James, what about Rain for Super? And he was like, I love it. And then he literally, like, bing, I got on my phone, he had sent me the script, and um, I went in my trailer, and I started reading it. I was 30 pages in, and I was like, oh my god, I'm in. This is amazing. And we took it out together, and we pounded the pavement, went into different producers' offices, and, and raised the money, and um, in a really hard time, it was during the recession, and, you know, I think it's a, it's a classic, and it's certainly a cult classic, and I, for people who haven't seen it, it's on Netflix, it's called Super, it's kind of a, 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 a dark, low-rent, kind of DIY deconstruction of a superhero movie. That's um, exactly what it is. I mean, it totally, it, and it's, yeah, watch it, I wouldn't, we brought it up, but it is, it is a fantastic movie. Uh, and you have a film that is opening this coming Friday, uh, The May. The May, yeah. So, so that's based on a book. Yep. And how is it, uh, I mean, yeah, but it's, it opens at the big uh, wide release uh, on August 10th, that's this coming Friday, a week, a week from today. And, yep. um, you know, so tell us about that. Yeah, um, it's uh, the biggest. I mean, it's terrific. It's, uh, what can I say? I mean, I'm not going to say it sucks. Uh, no, but it's really a fun, uh, awesome movie. John Turtletop, who did National Treasure uh, and a bunch of other great films, he really knows what he's doing. He knows how to do a big popcorn movie. It's fun for the whole family. It's definitely scary. It's got its thrills, but it also it doesn't take itself too seriously. It's got some nice humor running through it because ultimately it's about a giant shark. You know how seriously can you take that? But the the, the special effects on it are, are amazing, and what they did to create the shark and the danger of the shark is, is incredible. And I'm a big Jason Statham fan, and so I was really psyched to be worked with, working with him. I think he's one of those action stars, like he's always believable, you really believe he can kick ass. You know, you know when he says he's going to do something, he's like, I'm going to kick your ass. Like, you know that it's going to happen, you know, uh, you believe him. So. It was great, and it was a Chinese co-production, so there were a lot of Chinese actors and Chinese producers on it. Um, they split the budget, and it's opening in China and the U.S. the same day, and uh, so that's pretty cool, too. That's very cool. Uh, you, you know, I worked with John Krasinski for all those years on The Office. You know, he had directed a couple of films that I saw at Sundance, I go every year. And I gotta tell you, in, in the end of March, A Quiet Place, holy time. I saw it. I saw it opening weekend. I thought it was amazing. And, you know, people talk about it as a horror film. It's not a horror film. It's a science fiction film. I mean, it really is a sci-fi film. It's, you know, it's a monster movie. Um, and uh, he, did, he did a great job. And John was always the one who were doing The Office. He was always writing scripts. He was always developing material. Uh, he was a terrific director. Uh, he directed a couple of movies beforehand. And he's a really multi-talented guy. And he hit it out of the park with that movie. Really I want to open up to some audience questions we got. Uh, so let's take one from over here. Considering how uh, lethal Harry Mudd is, what are the chances we're dealing with a mirror universe Harry Mudd? Ooh! I think chances are slim, but I sure would love to 
meet the mirror universe Harry Mudd, who would be, a, he would just be a mean bastard. I mean, he would just, yeah, he would fuck you up. Yeah. That's a good idea. I'm going to text the writers and give them that idea. And I'm going to tell them that a, a rock star from 1977 gave me that idea. Second, one of the things we've heard from previous casts about their time on the show is that um, in their experience they, they didn't really get a ton of input on the scripts, particularly on the day that they were shooting. As somebody whose experience in, uh, in Hollywood has mostly been in the sort of comedy and improvisation space, what was your experience like in terms of being on set? Did you have the ability to improvise some of the lines? Was it all, you know, keep it going perfect to the script? What was it like on Discovery? Oh, great questions. Uh, the, that's, an, that's an excellent question about the short. I'm assuming it's after, but I, it doesn't. It stands alone, so it doesn't it doesn't really tie into the story of the discovery. So I'm not sure, but I really should know that. So I should probably ask them. Um, and yeah, they were very collaborative with me, um, and uh, which was amazing because they didn't have to be. I mean, most of the time when you're an actor, you're doing a guest spot role or a recurring role. It's like, here's your role, say the lines, do a great job. But they don't, they, they got, they're way too busy with other things. But they wanted to do it right and they were very open to feedback and I gave notes on the scripts and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, they let me improvise as well. So a lot of the things, um, a lot of the things you see in the episode were, were lines. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but um, I kind of have to, I feel like if you want me in something, you should let me improvise because it's one of my strengths and it will be better. Uh, and you don't have to use it, you can cut it out in the editing room as long as you get the line set. So it was it was very collaborative in that way. Um, yeah, I called Saru a bunch of strange names and, uh, and Jason, who I love to mock, uh, a bunch of strange names and uh, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> Next slide. So, I loved Backstrom, such a great character. You did him so well. What, what happened? Where'd he go? Yeah, um, someone was like, no one watched it. Um, that's partially true. It was, some people watched it, about as many people watched it as watched other shows, but they just, they were looking for hits. It was a new regime came into Fox at that time, and um, so they put on a bunch of other crappier shows. Um, but yeah, that was a show I did on Fox, 13 episodes. Um, we did um, after after The Office about a kind of an alcoholic, irascible, self-destructive detective um, in kind of the Columbo mode, and it was a, really a lot of fun. I'm sure the episodes are out there somewhere in someone's basement. If you can check them out, it's a, it's a terrific show. Thank you. Thanks very much. Our tier of rights. Uh, hi. Besides killing Lorca repeatedly, what was your favorite moment on the set of Discovery? <laughs> that was it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think the Mud's reunion with Stella was very meaningful to me because uh, Stella played such an important part, um, you know, in the earlier Muds. The high mud, especially, and so that was really fun um, to tie it up. It was he was very villainous, but it kind of had a, a sweet comic ending to it, and so that was that was a lot of fun to be re reunited with Stella. I love that couple ship of uh, Harry and Stella. Next one. Have you seen the movie Groundhog Day? <laughs> over and over. And over. <laughs> Star Wars shirt? Get lost, kid. <laughs> Why are you wearing a Star Wars shirt, dude? I don't know. I forgot my uniform. <laughs> you can buy one right in the, in the other room. Someone, can someone please find this young man? Any, a Star Trek uniform, please. And so, does someone have a Federation shirt to put on this poor child? <laughs> Leave off. 
We love you. See what I did there? Okay. Next question. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, love uh, when you're in Discovery. I love Discovery. Um, what do you think, since you're a fan of Star Trek, do you think Discovery, I mean, it's not your mom and dad Star Trek. Um, it's pushing the line a little bit. What do you think? Uh, is it a little darker or a little bit more, um, I don't know, risque or what? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, the producers to think about if you're put in that situation where you've got to produce a new Star Trek show after the J.J. Abrams movies, in which a whole generation of kids didn't watch the shows, they just know it from the, from the, from those movies, and, uh, and, you know, and it's 2017, you know, when it's going to launch, and, uh, it's post 9-11, and, you know, people are used to certain kinds of storytelling, and the way television has moved, you know, away from, network and syndication into streaming and stuff like that. They're put in a really tough position and I think they did an exceptional job considering, you know, the environment and the time that they needed to make the show. So they wanted it dark. They wanted a more like show. They wanted to get to some really gritty issues um, and tackle them in an edgy way and, uh, and they knew they wanted it to be you know, unfolding over the course of a season. So yeah, it's, it's not your mom and dad's Star Trek, nor should it be. I don't know um, how a, how you do a, a Star Trek where every week they go and discover a new planet. I, I don't know if that works in today's TV environment. Maybe it does, but uh, I think they did a, a terrific job and there were some amazing sequences and some great, great episodes and, and the cast is fantastic. Thank you. That's actually a really good question. I, 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 you know, I definitely got asked a lot over the last year, wow, this is different, this is dark. It's, it's, they actually use those words, this isn't your daddy's Star Trek, and I'd say, good, good, good. It shouldn't be different. If I wanted my daddy's Star Trek, which is not Star Trek, I'd watch the original series Next Generation. That's, that's what Blu-rays are for, that is what Netflix and CMS All Access is for. I want something different. I love those GG movies because they were different. I love Discovery because it is different. Star Trek should evolve. It should be different. And I love the way the, the season ended with Discovery. Uh, you all saw the end. I'm not going to spoil it. Okay. I don't know. I think about a third of this audience has not seen it. That's my guess. By round of applause. No, that you don't need applause. See. If you do show of hands, yeah, show of hands if you did not see. What are you missing out? Boy, oh boy, are you missing out? Right? I can't see me yet. I'm not gonna see what my money is. I'm not gonna be see me yet. I'm six dollars a month. I work hard for that six dollars a month. Can I have a mochaccino, frappuccino, papacino, an extra mocha for I? Now I've shamed them into subscribing and watching. I just was going to say that, that the, uh, you know, this takes place a lot of 10 years before Kirk's time. And you got to get there. So there's got to be an arc. And we're seeing the beginning of that arc, and I think that's awesome. Next question. Rain, hi. I was hoping you might settle a bed between uh, me and a friend of mine here. Was Toby Flenderson really the Scram Strangler? <laughs> Absolutely, he was. Yeah, you win the bet. Next question. Uh, great to see you here. Uh, if Dwight Schrute were a Starfleet officer, what do you imagine his rank and position might be? <laughs> Best question ever. <laughs> um. Someone said beats. Yeah, who would be, um, did they have Federation Farmers? No. Uh, I think he, I think he'd want to be, um, 
He would, he would have started in engineering, but he'd want to be security. But he was too, he would shoot his phaser too much and like leave blast holes in the, in the walls. So then he's demoted from engineering to janitorial. <laughs> so these, the Dwight on the Enterprise show is Dwight mopping those floors. Someone's got to mop those floors. They're spotless. And it's not Roombas. It's not like modern Roombas. So that, that would actually be a great show. I'd watch that show. Next question. Was it disturbing to work on House of a Thousand Corpses? Oh, Rob Zombie. Good call. House of a Thousand Corpses. Um, yeah, I did that uh, right after I did uh, Galaxy Quest. Uh, that's a... Uh, um, that was the one, one year later I did, that was, that was the, the next job. Uh, yeah, was it disturbing? Yeah, it was disturbing. It was like being in the mind, in the nightmare mind of Rob Zombie. I mean, I remember doing the scene, and the, uh, I'm forget, forgetting the name, I think his name was Michael. It was a, the, the guy who had the giantism who was in the movie. Um, Matthew was his name. I forget his last name. Anyone know his name? Matthew? He was a giant. Yeah, McCrory, Matthew McCrory. And, um, you know, he's in the, we're eating dinner, and there's like baby fetuses in jars along the walls. And, uh, you know, we're eating with a family of psycho killers, and uh, it was pretty disturbing. Yeah, it was pretty disturbing, but uh, it was a, it's a terrific cult horror film, and just uh, Rob's a great guy. I was happy to be a part of it. I know this guy. Hey. Hey, you look familiar. You know, uh, Rain, you uh, starred in a film that I thought was pretty visionary. I think it kind of flew under the radar, but I loved The Last Memphisie. Mm -hmm. The Last Memphisie. And I just wondered if you could say anything about that uh, project, how you got involved in, with it. It seemed like it was kind of ahead of its time. Yeah, I feel like that film didn't get a fair uh, release and a fair shake, and I think there's there's so much great stuff in it, and some of the the sci-fi concepts in The Last Menzi are, are really uh, are really cool um, and relevant today. I just got sent the script. Um, they, they made me the offer, and uh, I really loved, you know, I love sci-fi, and uh, I liked the character a lot and, and, and wanted to be a part of it, and, uh, you know, people still still see that film every once in a while, and so, which is, which is great, because I think it's, a, it's I think it's a beautiful, you know, sci-fi for the whole family kind of film in the, in like kind of a throwback to the '80s, you know. Yeah, so. well, it does feel like that. Like that, Shane directed that, right? Uh, yeah, Bob Shane. Bob, Shane, Bob yeah. Shane, you know, *Labor of Love*. I think that was his personal pet project. Yeah, he had yeah. shepherded it along for years. He was the producer of *Lord of the Rings*, and he founded New Line Cinema, um, and uh, you know, great visionary entertainment dude. Yeah, definitely. Plus, you got Roger Waters to write the theme song, Hello, I Love You, which is like unbelievable. So, yeah. is anybody in there? So, I mean, if you can get Roger Waters to do the song for your film, that's yeah. pretty cool. Howard Shore did the soundtrack, so it was, it was great. Great question, Adam Malin. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott Lance. Thank you, Randy. <laughs> uh, final question over here. Hi, I was hoping you would just tell us a little bit about the organization you and your wife have been raising money for and what that is doing for young women. Oh wow, thank you. Are, you. are you a plant? Are you a plant in the audience? Um, that's very nice. Yeah, the, uh, so my wife and I do a lot of uh, nonprofit uh, charitable work. We founded a, a foundation in Haiti uh, doing uh, girl, uh, girls' education. Um, girls in Haiti are really uh, mistreated and abused and um, often not educated, and they're meant to just work in the markets and work in the fields and raise the kids and cook. Uh, they're often sexually abused. They're often, uh, you know, sold into into you know sex slavery, and um, it's a it's a it's a really abused population. So we we do we work in about 13 locations in Haiti with over 500 girls. We do uh, scholarships and arts education and literacy. We have a mobile computer lab. And, um, and we feed them, and we work with them and their families to continue their educational journeys. And it's called Lide Haiti, L-I-D-E Haiti. And you can go to lidehaiti.org and, and check it out. But it's, um, we go down to Haiti a couple times a year and um, continue you know, working on it. And uh, it 
it's a, it's a great uh, effort of, of love. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for your question. And thank you and Ray Wilson. Thank you very much.